Psalm 89 is the only psalm by Ethan the Ezraite. I like to call it a one-hit wonder. And it's next to another psalm that uh, is uh, a psalm of Moses, and it's Moses' only song as well. That's Psalm 90, so that might help you remember these two go together. 89 and 90, two one-hit wonders of Ethan and Moses. The uh, psalm is uh, for the occasion of, uh, of celebration of God's faithfulness, his steadfast love. And well, the first two-thirds of the psalm are just a fantastic hymn of praise and recounting the worthiness of God to be worshipped. And yet the psalm then concludes with uh, a time of lament uh, as the psalmist feels like in spite of God's faithfulness and his steadfast love, the nation has been abandoned by him. And it's a pretty good summary of the books uh, of the Psalms of Book 3. Book 3, of course, was compiled for use during the exile. And this must have been a very common thing in the exile to, to, yes, reflect on the truth, the reality of who God is, of his faithfulness, his steadfast love, his goodness, his power. And yet the reality was they were living in exile in Babylon. They were in a foreign land with little hope of ever being repatriated. And so they had serious questions of God. And was he really God? Was he really who they believed him to be? I classify this song as a as a hymn because it's it's primarily a song of worship, but know that there is elements of lament that occur near the end of it, and we'll end the psalm on somewhat of a, a negative note uh, because of that. This is a masculine of Ethan, the Ezraite. We don't know anything about him other than he is the composer of this one psalm. Notice how in the first four verses we have many references to time particularly the eternal nature of God. Uh, His steadfast love is forever, his faithfulness to all generations. Uh, So even though in the psalmist's time of exile, he feels uh, that uh, God has not been faithful, he returns to this reality that, nope, this is God's nature. This is who he is. He is eternally loving and faithful. And so the psalmist declares, I will sing of his love. I will make known with my mouth your faithfulness. Uh, For I said, steadfast love will be built up forever in the heavens. You establish your faithfulness. So he looks to the heavens. He looks to creation and he sees examples of God's faithfulness. And everything about the world says, yes, God is faithful. The second half of this in verses three and four is, well, God is faithful by nature. And he made a covenant with David that his offspring would be on the throne for all generations. And so we have an eternal God, verses 1 and 2, and we have an eternal promise, verses 3 and 4. And everything in the psalm is based on those two realities. Now he elaborates on the first of those in the next section. He says in verse 5, Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones, for who in the skies can compare to the Lord? He begins by looking up. And he looks here to the heavenly realm where the angels, the assembly of the holy ones, are worshiping God, declaring his faithfulness and his wonders. And he asks this rhetorical question, the first of several, uh, who can be compared? Lord, you are incomparable. There is no God who even comes close to you. Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? This is the the word Elohim, the sons of God, or the sons of might, which typically refers to God himself. Elohim is the name of God. However, on some occasions, it is used of heavenly beings or sons of might. So among the angelic beings uh, of the greatest of them, who is like the Lord, a God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones? There's a reference again to the angels. And awesome above all who are around in the second rhetorical question. The third is this. O Lord God of hosts, God of the angel armies, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you? So God's might, God's faithfulness, these are uh, personified as being around his throne. He's surrounded by them. So uh, uh, just a glorious expression of, of praise that begins above in the heavenly realm. And then we move to the earthly realm, the creation. We start with the sea. You rule the raging of the sea when its waves rise you still them. You crushed Rahab like a carcass. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. Rahab is a mythical sea monster subdued at creation. So that's the primary reference there, uh, that God 
uh, when he created, it says that the earth was formless and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And this is a, a picture of chaos. And uh, this sea monster, Rahab, is, uh, is that chaos uh, embodied. And so the psalmist says, you crushed Rahab like a carcass. And also, uh, we note that Rahab, we saw this in Psalm 87, is a poetic name for the nation of Israel. Rahab uh, as, uh, as, a, as, a, as a metaphor, because Egypt was a monster. I mean, when it came to Israel and their history with Egypt, uh, Egypt was seen as that kind of monster. So there may be a double meaning here, that not only did God subdue Rahab at creation, the monster of the sea, but God also subdued Egypt, this a political national monster. And uh, so that could be what's happening there. Another reference uh, in, uh, to geography in, verses, in verse 12, Tabor and Hermon. These are two mountains, Tabor, a, a mountain in Galilee, and then Hermon, a much taller mountain to the north in Lebanon, headwaters of the Jordan River, snow-covered mountain majesty. So we have in these verses uh, all three elements of creation, the water, the sky, and the earth, that all of these belong to the Lord, the heavens, the earth, the world, all that is in it, you founded them. This sounds a lot like Psalm 24, doesn't it? You have a mighty arm, strong as your hand, high your right hand. So God's God's power is a creator. And then thirdly, God's just and faithful rule. Righteousness, justice are the foundation of your throne. So God, God sits on righteousness and justice and steadfast love and faithfulness go before him. So they are personified. These uh, attributes are personified as going out ahead of God. Blessed are the people who know the festal shout. So a mockerism here, a statement of blessing. The NIV translates it this way. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you. I like that. It reminds us that worship is something that we learned and that hopefully we're always getting better at. Uh, blessed are the people who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your face, who exult in your name all the day, and your righteousness are exalted, for you are the glory of their strength. By your favor, our horn is exalted, our shield belongs to the Lord, our king to the Holy One of Israel. These are metaphors for the king, a horn symbolizing strength, shield symbolizing protection, and uh, our king. So introduce the king, and this will... Uh, begin a transition to the next segment of the song. Uh, so we praise God for uh, his incomparable greatness in the heavens, his greatness as creator on the earth, his just and faithful rule as king through his Messiah. And that will move us then to the center of the psalm and a, a discussion of the Lord's election of David uh, of old you spoke in a vision to your godly one and said, I have granted help to the one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found David my servant. With my holy oil I have anointed him. And so this takes us back to God's choosing of David as his anointed when he was selected as a young man. It goes on to describe how God established him and was with him and uh, blessed him in many ways. And we have an echo here of Psalm 2, this coronation psalm, where David and the kings that followed him would cry to God, You are my Father, my God, the rock of my salvation. You might think of Psalm 18, where David did that quite literally. And the highest, uh, I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. And that's what God said of the king. You are my son, Today I've begotten you. I'll make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. You'll rule them with power. And so uh, his promise is that my faithful love will be with the king, with David, and his descendants forever. My covenant will stand firm forever, his throne as the days of heaven. So the eternal covenant with David, that uh, he and one of his descendants would always reign on the throne is referred to there. Ah, but then we have the condition, well, if his children forsake my law and do not walk according to my rules, if they violate my statutes, then I will punish them with a rod, with stripes. However, I will not remove from him my steadfast love or be false to my faithfulness. So there's a recognition that the nation had free will 
and they exercised that free will. They turned away from God, and the result of that was the Babylonian captivity. They were morally responsible for that because they had forsaken God. Yet even then, the psalmist is convinced, and we are convinced, that God still remains faithful. He says here, I will not violate my covenant. My promise to David still stands. His offspring shall endure forever as long as the sun is before me, like the moon, a faithful witness in the skies. Every night you see the moon, every morning you see the sun. This is evidence of God's faithful promise that a descendant of David will be on the throne forever. However, the next section describes in a in a lament how it seems like this promise has been broken, that the nation has been rejected and God's wrath has been poured out on them. And so the raises the question, what about your promise, God? Zedekiah, the last king uh, of Judah, was in captivity in Babylon. He's been blinded. He has witnessed the death of his sons. There's no one left. Who is going to fulfill the promise made to David? Now, you know who that is. The psalmist didn't know that. Ethan didn't know that at the time. But you and I know that Jesus, who was introduced to us in the Gospel of Matthew as the son of Abraham and the son of David, is the fulfillment of this promise. God did not break his promise. A descendant of David will be on the throne forever and ever, and his name is Jesus. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself because the psalmist didn't go there yet. He returns to his lament. How long will you hide your face? How long will your wrath burn like fire? Remember how short my time is. What man can live and never see death? And he accents here our our mortality, the brevity of life. This is kind of a, a hint of what's to come. Psalm 90 has that same theme of the shortness of life. Man is but a breath. So Lord, where is your steadfast love of old? Where is your faithfulness that you swore to David? Take a look. We're mocked. We're bearing the insults of the nations. Babylonians are telling us in our captivity, where's your God? Sing us one of the songs of Zion. Come on, give it up. Walk away. What are they going to do? This book really ends with a question mark, and it is a central question of the, of the exile. What were the Jews going to do in exile? Were they going to walk away from God? Walk away from their history, from the promises that God had made to them? and embrace Babylonian culture? Were they going to say, well, I guess the Babylonians are uh, better than our God because they have defeated him in battle? Are they going to surrender? Or are they going to be faithful to God? And that is the question at the end of book three. It's really not answered. Notice how this book ends with a question, not a statement, as much as a question, as a doubt. How will that question be answered? Well, book four will begin to answer that question for the exiles. Meanwhile, the psalm concludes with the final word, your anointed. They mock the footsteps of your anointed. So while the Babylonians are the latest of many to mock Israel and her king, know that this very last word of book three points us, the very last word is Messiah. It points us as Christians to Jesus, the Messiah. The Messiah. He is the ultimate answer to the question that is asked in verse 49. Where is your steadfast love, which by your faithfulness you swore to David? The answer is in the Messiah, in Jesus. Book three will conclude with a short doxology, the shortest of all the doxologies. Blessed be the Lord forever. Amen and amen. Perhaps this short doxology reflects the question that is in the mind of the psalmist when he composes this psalm. God, what are you doing next? How are you going to bring us out of this? How are you going to restore us? How are you going to keep your promise that you made to David and to us? Well, the answer is he will keep that promise in Jesus.